so I'd like to begin by highlighting, <clears throat> excuse me, that although this is a topic I've been researching for a few years in relation to this specific archaeological context, so that's of the Bronze Age Aegean, uh, this is really the beginning of uh, my larger investigation into Maniports and their place in archaeological theory and practice more generally. Um, in February, we would start a post-talk on that exact topic, so Maniports. Um, so I'm really excited, I hope, in session, in discussion or in lunch afterwards, you can grab me and tell me of many of your examples of Maniports um, or ideas that you might have. So this paper then is less of a work in progress, but more of an early attempt to think through, define and highlight Maniports as artefacts, or as I should argue, distinctly powerful artefacts. But first, what is a Maniport? Well, I've really enjoyed the papers in the session thus far um, about archeological artefacts uh, that have been manufactured in a particular way, from a particular material, especially prestigious or valuable materials, those which have been modified, fragmented, decommissioned, or even in the case of those really interesting moulds, um, manufactured so as to manufacture something themselves. But Maniports, however, are none of these things. Um, they are defined by Kipfer in 2000 as, quote, any artefact or natural object that is transported, but not necessarily modified and deposited by humans later citing seashells or water-rolled pebbles as found inland as examples. Similarly, Maniports are defined by Darville in 2002 as an unmodified stone carried to its fine spot from elsewhere by human agency, later citing, you guessed it, seashells and water-rolled pebbles found inland as examples. So it's interesting here that <coughs> Darville specifies unmodified stone um, I think it's quite a narrow definition of Maniport, although definitely probably the most frequent one which we come across. Um, but it's important to notice that both definitions here emphasise, perhaps Darville more than Kipfer, the lack of anthropogenic physical modification as one of the main criteria for the definition of Maniports. But it's because of not only the lack of modification, but of the conscious human movement of Maniports that they have been at the forefront of discussions about the perceptive and cognitive capabilities of early humans. So I'm sure many of you recognise this. Um, this is the famous example of a Maniport is the Macapanzac Jasperite cobble, whose face-like features have been shown to be the product of um, erosion processes rather than any um, human manufacture. If we accept that this cobble, which is larger than a pebble in my definition, um, purposefully selected and moved to its fine spot by um, astropolithocenes, it is a Maniport that is millions of years old. So Maniports, mm -hmm. although seemingly simple, pose provocative questions and offer us an opportunity to reconsider the power of manufacture in archaeological interpretations of the material record. How artefacts might be imbued with power or significance without being physically changed, and how we might somehow recognise this. This is because Maniports are made through human action, yet not through the processes of manufacture or physical modification we usually associate with production. Rather, they are changed through conscious movement from one place to another, a process which in turn enacts a conceptual transition between our categories of natural and artificial. And actually, what's really interesting is I was explaining to my friends, um, as we all do, what the hell I was doing for the next two years. And they had a question, they said, well, if something, could you, could there be Maniports everywhere and you just don't realise? And the answer is yes. You can obviously only recognise Maniport from it being non-local to the context in question. So that it has, there is, you can recognise that it has been moved. Another factor to consider is that both Kipfer and Darville's definition are relatively recent. Well, kind of, if you think the 2000s is recent, even a very brief overview of very basic, um, well, reference texts reveal the absence of the term Maniport or its definition. However, that Maniports are absent or traditionally overlooked is unsurprising to somebody like me who researches Maniports in the Bronze Age Aegean. Um, I'm really interested in the context and the discussion that's surrounding them in Irish and British archaeology. Um, but in the Bronze Age Aegean, definitely their lack of manufacture 
has contributed to their exclusion from definitions of artefact and archaeological interpretations related to Bronze Age symbolism, belief and communal practice. In other words, they have not been perceived as powerful artefacts, although found in their hundreds at sites of communal activity to which they have obviously been moved in the Bronze Age. So one such context is the peak sanctuaries of the Middle Bronze Age in Crete, where one Maniport type, and that's pebbles, um, have been found at multiple, but not, definitely not all sites. So regrettably, when it comes to the case of pebbles found at the peak sanctuaries of Bronze Age Crete, so these are sites that have functioned as the foci for communal, seemingly ritual practices in the second millennium BC. The majority of peak sanctuary excavations pay little or no attention to the number, the size, the colour, or indeed the presence or the lack thereof of pebbles, leading to a distinct lack of relevant published material. Whilst attempts advancing their recognition as valid objects of study are inherently hindered by the lack of an extensive comprehensive data set upon which to base initial interpretations. In effect, we're stuck between a rock and a high place. Sorry, <laughs> I had to do it to you. But it is hopes that recognising Maniports as powerful artefacts, those which were clearly imbued with some element of significance resulting in or contributing to their deposition at these mountainous sites, may begin to provide a solution to this catch-22 situation. And it really is kind of a painful situation in which to be in. Um, although anecdotal, you know, I've seen with my own eyes, although if it's meant to be a 100% collection of excavations where pebbles are uh, thrown off the side of the hill. So when you literally see your data being destroyed in front of your eyes. One way of including Maniports in discussions of powerful artefacts, though, is to focus on the ways in which that they were produced. For the sake of this short paper, I'm going to focus on one small rural peak sanctuary in particular, but I just want to point out that pebbles are found elsewhere, usually in rural ones. And on this particular peak sanctuary site, it doesn't have any architectural features, um, but others, larger ones and later ones do. So, Adzipades, which is number 40 here, it's circled um, in red, is a project which from the very outset acknowledged the prominent concentration of pebbles found there as an important archaeological feature. Located approximately 20 kilometres from the modern town in Rethemnon, and overlooking the Ayas Vasilios River Valley, the small rural peak sanctuary of Atzipades is divided by natural rock formations into two topographically distinct areas. So you see the upper terrace uh, there, just where the um, kind of lovely bit of concrete they inserted it in. Here is the upper terrace, and then the lower ter terrace to the east. So careful plotting of the pebbles locations revealed that they did not constitute a defined floor or surface, but rather appear to have been thickly scattered throughout the deposit layers. So this is really important because in um, secondary archaeological discussion of this site, not done by the excavators, the pebble feature, which you'll see in a moment, has been described as a pebble floor. And <coughs> this is definitely a trend that I see in discussing maniports and pebbles in particular in the Bronze Age Aegean, where they're often treated as um, are interpreted as having a structural function, even though there is no archaeological evidence for a floor, and indeed the excavators are explicit in saying that it is not. So the excavation of a relatively large concentration of potsherds and clay figurines in this same area, indicated by the red circle, um, led to its identification by excavators as the main liturgical part of the sanctuary. So this is this um, as you can see, it's kind of enclosed by the natural topography, um, so separating both the upper and lower terraces. So a roughly circular earth feature was discovered in the centre of this pebble scatter, which you can see here, clearly visible due to its variation in soil colour and consistency in comparison with the surrounding soil, in addition to its notable lack of pebbles and other finds. So if you see right underneath the scale bar there, you see a little circular uh, void, so to speak. Similarly to the surrounding rock river pebbles, the feature also appears to suggest the transportation and deliberate deposition of non-local rock, exemplified by the shallow hollow partly lined with schist-like stones over which it was placed, 
a rock type seemingly foreign to the geology of the immediate area. Now, whilst the absence of pebbles in the midst of such a defined concentration suggests the previous presence of some form of installation, it is unknown what originally stood in the feature, although excavators have suggested a crude idol, a vessel for receiving offerings, and a betel or sacred stone as possible foci for such intensive deposition of both pebble, pebbles and other artefacts related to ritual activity. So in this um, particular area, there was a lot of sherds related to shapes, um, uh, vessels that would carry liquid. <coughs> so a stone installation of special significance does exist as an attractive interpretation in this ritual and spatial context, especially considering the clear preference for non-local stone in the immediate area, as exemplified by the thick scatter of river pebbles and schist-like lining. Whilst the exact nature is unknown, what apparent, however, is that the pebbles made up a large percentage of the dense cluster of archaeological material that surrounded this feature, one which was seemingly placed to exploit the higher ground of the upper terrace and the natural east-west axis of the site as a whole. Indeed, the prominence of this particular po point, both spatially in its central axial position and visually, is a particular interest when one considers the importance attached to visibility or rather intervisibility between peak sanctuaries and various elements of the surrounding landscape. So this is this is a lovely spring day in April, and this is my photo, so not the excavators. And uh, as you can see, <coughs> I stood on the upper terrace looking down to the lower here. The pebble scatter would be to my right, and I'm looking down onto the river valley. But I would like to stress that these peak sanctuary sites weren't um, places of really arduous pilgrimage. It would have been a familiar landscape. It's about, uh, <coughs> from where we hiked, about four to five hours from the River Valley floor up into the Peak Sanctuary site. And a characteristic of Peak Sanctuary sites in the Middle Bronze Age is that they're usually not on the highest uh, point, contrary to the name's chest, but one, a site which usually has the best intervisibility with the surrounding area, and indeed on a very clear day, other Peak Sanctuaries. So in keeping with their conceptualization of ritual action with the landscape of Atsipaves as a dynamic embodied performance, excavators Pete Field and Morris have more recently stressed the sequential and the experiential element of depositional practice, identifying distinct human processes through which material came to accumulate at this peak century. So making the journey, traveling the road, bringing, carrying, holding, performing, offering and placing. Methodolog methodologically following in the sequential approach and metaphorically following in the steps of the Minoan visitors to peak sanctuary sites, we must thus begin in our contemplation of pebble deposition as embodied action as the Minoans would have done in practice with the journey to the peak sanctuary site. So when envisioning this journey in terms of the transportation of pebbles, it is evident that the Minoan movement towards peak sanctuary sites, um, in this case, with the movement of a certain type of material, began at specific points in the landscape. So for the, from the shorelines of river or sea, um, in the case of Atspades, from uh, presumably the nearby river bed. Whilst we cannot infer that the collection of the pebbles immediately preceded their subsequent transportation and deposition, it is important to note that this act of collection or perhaps selection, must have incurred in relation to specific features in the inhabited landscape, linking pebbles logically and perhaps symbolically with their distinctly fluvial origins. Now, whilst I've used the kind of tr term transportation in kind of a general manner thus far, it's important to note that the movement of pebbles as materially tangible artefacts was far more than the transport of material but rather a performative and sensory prelude to the rituals on the peak sanctuary sites. As such, if we consider the possibility that pebbles as small, relatively light and durable artefacts may have been held at the hand or in close proximity to the body, we may begin to contemplate certain ways in which they possess certain significance or even gain significance as the journey towards the peak sanctuary progressed. So Gibson describes in her 2015 um, anthropological study of a group of students' participation in the Al Neil Harrelson hike in southwestern British Columbia, that they each carry a single stone to the summit of the hill to deposit. 
she identifies an increasing significance of the stone to its bearer throughout the ritualized journey, an intermingling of pebble and person through their shared movement through the landscape, during which, quote, human and thing are blended, shaped, created, and reformed throughout the hike. The rock, its weight, size, influence how students climbed the hill and brought meaning to that practice. The rock made a difference. Student and the thingly qualities of the rock were entangled and redefined throughout the climb." End quote. Here then, it appears that the students' relationships with their stone and the place of its eventual deposition are mutually transformative. The cairn of stones that has accumulated at the summit of the hill over the years is thus representative of communal, ritualized and historical practice in which timeless relationships with the human and the non-human world are embedded. Although the complications on the limitations of applying anthropological theory and analogy to the archaeological evidence of the ancient worlds must, of course, be acknowledged, the ritual practices related to the Harrison hike certainly give us food for thought when we're thinking about the Minoan movement of pebbles to peak sanctuary sites. With both journeys venturing through familiar landscapes involving the transportation and the deposition of, in some cases, manually portable, I'm unsure, they're, they're definitely ambitious, um, some students, um, and, culminating, <laughs> and culminating at sites of elevated communal and seemingly ritualized <coughs> significance. That many ports are consciously moved, recognized be non-local, and in the context of journeying, socially and culturally produced, it raises the question as to why they have not figured more prominently in the archaeological discourse surrounding Crete and Peak sanctuary sites. The answer, perhaps one possible answer, is relatively simple. Many ports are really difficult to talk about. Take from me. Um, in the case of pebbles, this difficulty is due in part to both the practical and the interpretive complexities involved in recognising and categorising them as artefacts, in comparison with other crafted items which might conform more comfortably with the traditional understanding of material culture. Their small size and smoothness speaks to their natural formation, but also the difficulty this process of production poses to any chronological or typological analysis based solely on physical appearance. Pebbles therefore occupy a curious and complex interpretive position as artefacts that exist both the result of natural sea and river processes and in the context of deliberate deposition atop peak sanctuary sites, products of conscious human activity. In effect, we are reliant on patterns of deposition rather than those of technological creation. The waters of rivers and seas may move, change current and converge, but their production of pebbles through the natural processes of erosion are inherently independent of social or cultural factors. In other words, whilst Cretan rivers and seas continually collect, carry and deposit sediment, we must look instead to the archaeological evidence for similar human processes, exemplified in the patterns of deliberate pebble deposition atop peak sanctuary sites. Although Nowitzki has suggested that future study of pebbles might help our understanding in the frequency of visits to visitors um, to visits of peak sanctuary sites. Um, studies which, in relation to the current availability of data seem near what possible, I would argue that their recognition, discussion and interpretation as both manuports and artefacts may offer us so much more. As I've shown, although their explicit meaning may never truly be realised, their acknowledgement as powerful artefacts, as significant and invaluable features of the archaeological record, highlights their meaningful role in Minoan communal activity. Through refocusing on the sequential, multi-stage and embodied processes through which they came to be at peak sanctuary sites, rather than the single stage of deposition, we come to realise that many ports, like all other artefacts, are purposefully made and they make in return. They are not made from prestigious materials, they are not technologically produced, but we cannot say that many ports are not powerful. Thank you very much.